Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi everybody, I'm Ron Brewington and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Brought to you by Photography is an Art, Javi Brandman, Master Photographer, located at 1307 North San Fernando Boulevard, Burbank, California. And attorney Ron Irwin's new book, Haiku, Style, Passion, Heart, and author Larry Buford's book to the future, Time, Travel, Message in a Capsule. And State Farm agent Carla Green, and we have a new sponsor today, ladies and gentlemen, actor, renowned actor Rob Bryanstein is, has a training facility. It's called an actor space. Roll it. Ladies and gentlemen, my first guest today is an internationally acclaimed filmmaker. Born in Haiti, he has written and directed numerous feature-length films. You've just seen his Broadway Pictures Entertainment Incorporated company see some of the products that they have put out. Without further ado, please welcome Patrick Jerome. Ron, thanks Thank for you. having Thank me. Thank you for having you here, sir. It's welcome. Such a pleasure to welcome. be here. Welcome. Have you here in, Amer in, in Hollywood and Burbank and yes. all the good places <laughs> and just having yourself for fun. Yes. Um, Got to ask you, where did you begin the journey that made your success possible? Well, I mean, I, of course, I made my first feature film in mm -hmm. Haiti. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Haiti, I mean, we don't have a film. We didn't have a film industry at the time. Right. So it was all guided uh, by passion, you know, labor of love. And uh, mm -hmm. you just uh, follow, you know, uh, what your heart is telling you to do. And I went to a movie theater for the first time. I was 12 years old. And then um, a week later, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to make film. You know, after that uh, experience that I, I saw, I saw actually a karate film that was very violent called Vengeance. Mm -hmm. And I was traumatized. And then I, I talked to a friend of mine. And he says, no, not all movies are like that, you know. And then uh, he convinced me to go again, and then I went back again, mm -hmm. and then uh, discovered the next film. It was a film with Clint Eastwood with that little monkey, and I was like, oh, that's different, you know? And then uh, that's how I started to develop, you know, the passion for it. I knew that I had uh, stories uh, uh, telling, you know, uh, um, capabilities, you know, uh, um, in me, so that kind of attracted me to start writing. Mm -hmm. So, which brought me to, um, you know, to, to start writing, you know, a TV series and so on, and movies, and which is my first love, by the way. You know, writing is like my number one thing, you know, in the film industry. Yes. So that's how it all started. Wow. I understand that a little bit early in your life, you had an aunt who came and spent the summer with you. Yes, yes. And uh, from that, what happened? Yes, actually in Haiti, you know what, in the summertime, you have, you know, it's either you go to the countryside or you have people from the countryside coming to you. So I had an aunt that come to us, and she was telling us stories every night, you know. Um, that was amazing. And um, I was just sitting there listening. I was very young, like eight, nine years old. And then uh, when she, she, she left... All my brothers and sisters and friends in the neighborhood keep on asking me, okay, oh my goodness, who's going to tell us a story tonight? <laughs> and then I ended up saying, and I said, you know what, I'm going to be the one telling the story tonight. So that's how it all started. You know, the, the kids gathered around and I start to tell a story just, you know, 
you know, improvising just yeah. like that. Right. And at some point, my mother was inside and she didn't hear no, nobody else because the kids usually makes a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. And then she says, oh, uh, are you guys out there? I can only hear Patrick's voice. They were like so lost and like glue and listening to me, mm -hmm. you know. And then after that, you know, I make that kind of connection. They keep on asking me every day what story you're going to tell tonight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's when I, you know, I started to make that connection with storytelling. And then, of course, later on in life, um, I ended up getting inspired by true events and true stories that is going on around me and around, you know, what I experience in life. Okay. Because as you know, in making a film, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yes. Definitely. Definitely. That's a very, you know, interesting process. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you get to be professional in it, you have to find a way to master that, the beginning, the development, <laughs> and the end. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, the, uh, the rhythm of the film, you know, to bring all different kind of special, you know, uh, uh, aspect in it that makes it entertaining. But at the same time, to stay true to the original idea gotcha. of the film. Gotcha. What was it like growing up in Haiti? Well, what can I say? Uh, for me, I had a special uh, upbringing in Haiti. I mean, growing up in Haiti, to me, I was surrounded by arts in general. Mm -hmm. I studied with music, and I used to paint and, and, and draw, and ended up getting into the, the, the movies uh, 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 business at the same time. So for me, it was all arts around my life. That's when I discovered you know, my things as an artist, you know, through music mm -hmm. first. A drawing and music and then and then and then the movie industry so with all my friends with all my connections people were l always you know uh, supporting me mm -hmm. or being around me um, you know to 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 express all different kind of artistic expression even plays you mm -hmm. know I did a play in Haiti uh, that I presented that was amazing at that time too yes. uh, and then my first feature film uh, uh, of course you know that I made down there in Haiti Ruthless gang, Réseau Sans Pitié in Haitian Creole. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, so for me, yes. you know, growing up in Haiti, it was like the artistic touch. I think there's a special strength there mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, people who really, really uh, have the skills to, you know, express them, themselves as artists. Uh, to find themselves, and I'm I'm glad that I find it at such an early age. So I grew up around that. Okay, but you did leave Haiti. Why? I left Haiti because of my first uh, feature film, uh, Woodless Gang, which was about gang violence mm -hmm. uh, in Haiti. Um, after February 7, 1986, uh, when Duvalier left Haiti, the country was supposed to go to a, you know a political. Uh, de uh, a democratic process. So then we ended up having a lot of violence that erupted, you know, in Haiti, yes. where a lot of gangs were formed. At the time, they called them Zenglendo. Okay. And then um, it was fascinating to see how, you know, they were like uh, outlaws that was running the street and, and doing their operations, and there were really uh, nobody to stop them. Okay. And that amazed me. I ended up making my first feature film about that true story. Wow. Um, you know, that, that was happening there. And of course, uh, we had a military coup eight days after I released the film, and then they came after me, um, you Say know, what? to take away my life. And wow. um, so I had to leave the country a year in, in, in a half later with political asylum uh, to come to the United States. So, um, so, I mean, it was very hard to deal with, you know. I mean, when you're so young and then you kind of do something that shake an mm -hmm. entire system, and then uh, you 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 kind of you know face that fate that kind of results. It's really something you know that is you know that you, that you know mark you for the rest of your life. And unfortunately, Haiti today, uh, as you may have heard in, in the news, you know it, it's getting worse. We have mm -hmm. more gang violence. And that movie was a prediction. If you don't help the youth, if you don't support them, you know they will go to options to survive. And gang violence will be one of those options. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes this movie right now, I mean, it is a Haitian classic film, yes. you know, um, because it touched a subject that was so real. Um, then, then, like I said, almost 30 years later, it mm. got worse. And we just hope for the best for the country, and we hopefully it will get out of this situation. Yes. In Haiti, how do they look at you, look upon you, the people in the country? <laughs> I don't know about this generation right now, but mm -hmm. um, but I know for sure. Actually, 
uh, uh, recently, last month, I received uh, an email from a company that wanted to create a new movie theater, and then they want to name one of the screening room after me. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what an honor. <laughs> you earned it. You earned it. Yes. Thank you. And then, uh, you know, that's amazing. Uh, and I, I, went, you know, I made my first music video there in Haiti as well, which was Slaves in the Bate. And that's kind of talk about the Haitians courting the sugar cane mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic. So it always have some kind of a national um, statement uh, from my artistic expression. So, you know, some people see me as an artist, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that is an activist at the same time, uh, a rebel. Um, but for me, I'm just an artist. I just express things that is going on that I observe in life. Okay. And I get inspired to say something about it. And of course, uh, what I do kind of affect in a, our entire population mm -hmm. because it has some so strong social meaning and, and, and political statement at, the, uh, at that time. So I guess people interpret it the way they see me. So that's how I would say the Haitians see me. Okay. When you came to America, what, uh, what, what part of America did you settle in? I, I, I went to Boston, and I, you know, and, I, and I lived there for years because my father was living there. Mm -hmm. And as you were leaving Haiti to go to somewhere, you know, especially with political asylum, you would go to where you have families. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was, you know, the reality that I had to go to Boston, you know, which I like, you know, a lot, mm -hmm. you know, which has done a lot to me <laughs> in terms of producing and, and, and evolve, you know. Okay. But, um, you know, of course, you know, I had to adjust myself. I mean, after I arrived in Boston, I spent 10 years without making a film because I had to adjust with the new system. Yes. And I had two kids growing up with me, you know, uh, as a single dad. And that was tough, you know, and I wanted to be around my family, my mothers, my sisters, um, you know, and, and, and that was, you know, my life, you know, Boston. Mm. Yeah. I understand in 2003 you founded and became the executive director of the Boston International Film Festival. Wow. Yes, the Boston International Film Festival. Actually, after I made my first uh, feature film, Deportation, mm -hmm. uh, which is available right now actually on Amazon Prime, if people want to ch you know check it out. Yes. Um, we ended up going across you know uh, the United States, playing in several film festival. Actually, we came here in Los Angeles and okay. presented here at the Los Angeles International Film and Video Film Festival. We had the big world premiere yes. here in Los Angeles. That was my first time that I came here. Um, and, and, and so that was amazing. So that, that movie kind of opened my eyes to see some international film festival. Mm -hmm. And after the audition, we raised half a million dollars to make my next film, which is Haul At Me. After we produced the film, it says, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? So that's when the idea of the film festival came. Mm -hmm. So we contacted the city of Boston to find out you know, how to do it, uh, uh, to make it official. So we ended up going to the mayor's office and having a meeting, which was amazing. And a mayor, many no man, he was such a great, you know, wonderful mayor. And then um, you know, we all go through the process and it all become possible. And we were shocked. Mm. That um, you know, it just happened, you know, like this naturally, like that, so organic, you know, so natural. And then, um, so basically, the first year of the Boston International Film Festival, I was in the executive director. There was somebody else who was the executive director of the Boston International Film Festival, an African American older man that um, that was born and raised in Boston and so on. But uh, two, three weeks before the festival, he bailed out. Oh, sure. So much pressure was coming towards yes. us, what those people doing this film festival and so on, and then it just MIA. So I had to step up and, and take that responsibility because I was the founder. I was the one behind everything with my team and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's when it all started, Then that's mm -hmm. when I had to take the responsibility, and then uh, I stick with it since. Right. We have a picture right now. Uh, can you show that, Tony? Uh, this is a picture of you and a gentleman by the name of Tom Sizemore. Oh, yes, that was the 10th. Anniversary of the anniversary, Boston International yes. Film Festival. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yes, uh, we opened the festival with a movie that he was a star in with Rebecca Chani. Yes. Um, that was the uh, director of the film, writer director. Gotcha. So it was amazing, you know. And through the years, we have so many people coming, you know, people like him, very mm -hmm. cool guy. Mm -hmm. You know, it was good to be in his company. And then we had, uh, you know, it, it was fun. Indeed, indeed. They call it the Biff. 
I like that. I like that. Well, Beef Boston International Film <laughs> yes, Festival. Yes, I like that. Actually, when uh, when we started the festival, we find out many there were many other beefs around, like you know, Bermuda International, Berlin, you know, Brooklyn International. Well, there were so many, wow. but at the same time, we are beef. We are Boston International Film Definitely. Festival. My brothers, you speak. I think about the diaspora. The diaspora. Uh, when I think about you're from uh, Haiti, people mm -hmm. come here from Nigeria. They come from different parts of the world. They come here to L.A. and Hollywood. They want to show people what they can do. It is marvelous to see that. Yes, indeed. indeed. Well, actually, you know, I, I as you know, I studied my first feature film in Haiti, and yes. then I did my first feature film in Boston. But I always had the opportunity to come here to present my movies. You know, um, after deportation, we, we, we opened here, mm -hmm. and then I had a world of ears mm -hmm. that we opened here, here too, at the Hollywood Black Film Festival, yes. which was amazing. <laughs> and then recently, Assassin Behind the Glass at the Chinese Theater. Yes. So that was, uh, you know, that was special. Okay. Yeah. 2012, two words, beyond control. Beyond control. Yes. <laughs> so that was one a labor of love. You know, yes. it was such a pleasure working with Fred Williamson. The hammer. You know, the hammer. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. When you grew up watching somebody, mm -hmm. you know, on the screen, and then you get a chance to work uh, 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 with him. Yes. You know, uh, it was such an honor, you know, to work with him and to learn from them, from all their experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a wonderful kind of, you know, time filming with him. We, we brought him to Boston. And, um, you know, he, he, I mean, like, it, it was such a great experience. The same we had with Against the Job. Mm -hmm. With my movie Against the Job with Leon, uh, 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 you know, Leon that had been, you know, with the, uh, mm -hmm. all those movies that he had been in. We watched so many films, yes. you know, uh, like Cool Running, you know, uh, um, you know, which was like amazing mm -hmm. film. And then, uh, and then Lonette Marquis that I had the chance to work with, too. Uh, which, you know, she's like has been in, you know, so many major films that you watch them as growing up, you know. Yes. You dream to work with actors like that, and then when you get the chance to do it, it's like, whoa. Wow. You know, it's just amazing. Here's a picture of you on the set. <laughs> you, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Way oh, back that's, when. That's, that's a movie with that, that Mike Starr yes. that, that uh, you know, that has been in so many films as well, uh -huh. you know, in the Hollywood productions. Um, that was, you know, that was amazing. Right. Uh, it was great working with, you know, all those actors. Yes. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a special experience when you used to watch an actor on, on the big screen. And then you ended up having them playing in your own films. Yes. And then, um, you know, you just have to make sure that, you know, you get what you want as the director. Yes. You know, to give them the direction. This is exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, not to let yourself, you know, influence by what you've seen them doing, you know, because you know your story. Usually I write my stories that I'm producing. So I know exactly what I want. And it is very important for me to stay focused and get that done. Gotcha. You know, to say, this is work now. Let's do this. Okay. You know, but it's very challenging. Yes, yes. Yeah. 2019, this year you had a damn good film that year, with this year with a movie called Assassin Behind the Glass. Yes, Assassin Behind the Glass. Once again, this is the third movie we present here in Hollywood. Okay. But this one was special because we had the chance to do it at the Chinese Theater, yes, um, yes, you know, which Chinese is a well-known, yes. you know, theater, yes. uh, you know, in the world. In the world, right. You know. And mm -hmm. we had the opportunity, I set it up, you know, with my lawyer that helped us to do this. And it was a tremendous experience. All the actors came here, uh, walked the red carpet and take lots of pictures. And, and then uh, we ended up having, you know, a, a ball, you know, really presenting the film here. It's supposed to be more of an industry screening with a lot of people, a lot of mm -hmm. distribution company were interested in the film. And then uh, we kind of make it easy to come here to do the world premiere. And that was the hell of an experience experience that was wonderful let's take a look at that experience <laughs> <laughs>
you. <laughs> Marvelous. How'd you feel being out there on Hollywood Boulevard? Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the stars down there. <laughs> See me after after this thing, so we can get you a star one of these days. I'll help you get stars. <laughs> well, all the actors, all everybody yes. that works on the film, we consider them as you know the star that shine to yes. make this movie happen. Yes. And Assassin Behind the Glass once again was inspired uh, by true events. Um, my my business uh, has a post office uh, that we used to go to take you know our mail from from you know on a regular basis in Dorchester, and then once I went there few times and I saw a young black male was shot right in front of that post office mm -hmm. so and then later on the government built the bulletproof war glass inside the post office to protect the walkers so yes. basically that's what inspired me really um, to write that you know story you know mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, I, I was just even joking about one of the person walking there says, oh, my goodness, I used to come here to do my transaction. I could even touch you now. You're behind a bulletproof wall glass. You know, <laughs> I have to do on the little gate in there and then get things going. Yes. So that was, you know, amazing to me. And then, uh, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a movie that talk about, you know, um, snitching, you know, what do you do if you, you know, ended up facing something in, in our society and see something happen? What do you do about it? Mm. You know, do you tell the authorities? You know, um, you know what do you keep it to yourself? What's your responsibility? And at the same time, it just addresses you know, the reality of violence on the street. You know, uh, in, in in the urban neighborhood. You know, what are we doing about it? It's kind of raised questions, yes. and and I kind of like that. You know, that's one thing that inspired me all the time. You know, it's things that are, that are going on in life. Mm -hmm. Patrick Jerome, you have not, no grass grows under your feet, sir. I understand you have a new movie out called Noam Chomsky International Extension? Well, Noam Chomsky Internationalism and, and, and Extinction, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a landmark lecture that, um, you know, we, we did with Noam Chomsky um, that's supposed to, uh, to, to came out. We did it. We had to work on it again and again and again because, um, you know, all, all the political things mm -hmm. that were going on that keep on changing from time to time. I mean, it, it is a very inspiring documentary about, you know, the planet, about you, us as human beings. Where are we going? You know, mm -hmm. are we facing uh, uh, extinction? You know, what are we doing about it? So I would let people to draw their own c conclusion as they watched it. But I think it is so powerful because we are here on this planet. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, the question is always there. Where are we going? Are we protecting it? Yes. You know, are we yes. doing the right thing? The right thing, yes. You know, so it's a documentary I think people should watch and draw their own conclusion. But I'm glad that I had the chance to work with Noam Chomsky because it's such a well-known, you know, intellectual that, you know, that affected the world in so many ways. Had you. And, um, you know, I feel privileged really to get the opportunity to, uh, to work with him on that, new, on that uh, documentary. What else is in the future for you? Well, actually, we just filmed here in Hollywood Animated Conspiracy. It's a teaser that we are getting um, to launch a new feature film that we are very excited about. You know, it has a lot of fighting and martial arts in it. You know, I'm thinking about a lot of potential stars, if, including Fred Williamson, to be involved. Uh, and, and a bunch of other names um, that we are looking forward to working. It's very exciting. We have a very young talent, a very talented young lady um, that is that that did a performance that is amazing. So we will be sharing some information soon about that. And uh, I have a number of projects that we will, we want to do something about Toussaint Louverture, uh, a friend of mine, Jean Sena Fleury. He we used to be a George in Haiti. He wrote a book about mm -hmm. Toussaint Louverture. It was one of our heroes. Uh, from the Haitian revolutions um, that, uh, you know, that brought the international uh, justice to court, uh, the international system, you know, that uh, provoked slavery to mm -hmm. court. Um, and that, that is an amazing, a very sensitive, yes. uh, a very strong subject. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this as well. Patrick, we're running out of time. I just we, we got to have you back again. I mean, there's no question about it. Too. It's uh, my pleasure indeed. to be here, man. You know, Reem Kate, Kate McCadden? Rim? Yes. Yes. She yes. She sends yes. her best. Yes. Yes. I call her less <laughs> nice to say to Hi, Rim. Thank you so much for all your support and yes. everything. She told me about you. Yes. 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 Thank you so much. May Robert. I have your right hand, please? <laughs> this is my trademark. Always for good luck. Still <laughs> Thank you. Hold on to that for good luck. All right. This and is my good luck. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much. Looking forward to it. Yes, indeed. It's Thank you, Ron. You are doing a wonderful job Thank here you. in Hollywood. It's good folks like you that yes. make it possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Ugh.
Wish we had more time. My goodness. <laughs> this is The Actor's Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. The studio of Harvey Brandman Photography as an Art is proud to offer you a $100 discount off any photo package valued at $300 or more. Now, Harvey's been in the business for nearly a quarter of a century, and he certainly knows how to take care of his customers. So, please give him a call today at 818-954-9294. That's 818-954-9294. You'll be glad you did. And oh, by the way, please tell Harvey that you heard about his offer right here on The Actor's Choice. Haiku, style, passion, heart. It's the latest release from author and attorney Ron Irwin. The book was inspired by the author's first exposure to haiku well over half a century ago. Now, this experience produced within him a deep passion to experience Asia, which he later did as a U.S. Marine. The book is available in paperback at lulu.com. That's lulu.com. And Irwin says he'll give 20% of net book sales split evenly between the veterans of foreign wars and Vietnam veterans of America. Book to the Future. Time Travel, Message in a Capsule. It's a new book by author Larry Buford. It's an historical and faith-based account of how what we do and follow today will affect us tomorrow. The author also calls it an adventure for those who want to travel back through time. The book is now available in paperback for only $17.95 from Amazon. So please get your copy today. And now, a word from State Farm agent Carla Green. Roll it. Let me ask you something. What do you see when you look at your home and your car? Do you see a bundle? A combo deal. That's how other insurance companies see them. But a State Farm agent sees so much more. Because a State Farm agent sees your home and your car as more than just four walls and four wheels. They see the things you've worked really hard for. So why not give them the protection they deserve? Let me help you with that. Give me a call. State Farm Agent Carla Green, 213-239-9675. I look forward to speaking with you. Thanks, Carla. And like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. For more information, call 213-239-9675. That's 213-239-9675. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today to welcome a new sponsor. Uh, it's called An Actor's Space with classes and private coaching by veteran actor Rob Brownstein. An Actor's Space has Thursday night classes for working actors and Tuesday foundation and technique class for early career actors. The idea is to build on each actor's strengths and who you are to help refine and reimagine your acting and your career. Now, for more information about this organization, uh, please contact uh, class at robbrownstein.com. That's class at ronbrownstein.com or call at 323-646-1268. That's 323-646-1268. Thank you. And finally, if you have a product, a service, or an upcoming event that you'd like to see advertised on this program, please call 323-533-1036. That's 323-533-1036. Uh, uh, prices are very effective, very affordable. Okay. This is the Actors' Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. Roll it. I did for seven hours. Seven hours. And in all that time, you didn't think that perhaps Miss Staley's statements might be colored by? No. Yeah. Someone on Watts' team did. And I could loan you my copy of Middle Eastern Mambo. <laughs> you guys just have erotica. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's a cult classic. What's the big deal? I'm nervous. Shh, don't worry so much. Can it wait? You are so lovely. <laughs> Money is the only way he knows how to express it. Yeah, My next guest today was born in Jersey City, New Jersey, <laughs> raised in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Chandler, Arizona. Now she's traveled all over the globe training in the, what, what do they call it, the Meisner Technique at the renowned William Esper Studio in New York City. She's, the, she's been an actress, a writer, and even a director. 
And she's got to tell us about a new play that she's in, uh, directing, which you want to hear about that one. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Raina Dutt. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. It's so good to meet you. God, I, 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 when they, and I want to thank your publicist, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, we were under a time thing, and she said, Ron, give me, she said, he, you need to talk to this lady. <laughs> she's the one. So he, he is the one. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Yeah, My first question is, what brought you to the stage? Um, what brought me to the stage? Uh, back in high school, I, um, I was involved in speech and debate. Okay. And um, in speech and debate had uh, interpretation events. So we were performing po poetry and prose and <coughs> scene work with our scene partners. And it was, um, you know, it went to the state level and the national level, et cetera. Yes. But um, from there, I, I had a teacher, Mel Olson, who used to really inspire me and tell me I could do anything I wanted to do with my life and Ooh. I could be whatever character I wanted to be. Um, he was really an inspiration, and that was the first time I felt that I was, um, you know, part of part of a bigger tribe of people. Uh, so from there, I did West Side Story in high school, um, and he he really encouraged me to just do whatever I wanted to do, and and it ultimately led to this. So, so yeah, acting became a part of my own social culture, my own fabric of people. Um, you know, people from all different walks of life come to the theater and performance because mm -hmm. it's the one place where you can bond as a human with yes. each other um, no matter where you're from or what language you speak or um, what your cultural heritage is mm -hmm. people just come together and I think that's that's why I was brought into the arts wow what a, what, what, what a start mm -hmm. having people supporting you mm -hmm. family other people yep. that's what makes it work yeah absolutely Indeed. I understand that you started as a TV and film actress 2004, you did film star, the Peter Patel story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you tell us about that one? Yeah. Yeah. So um, when, uh, when I went to New York for the first time, I went there to study. I had done a show called Suburbia yes. here in L.A., which Seamus Dever was in. I believe you interviewed him last yes. week. Nice guy. Um, yeah. So he, he was a speech and debater as well. And then uh, we both came to L.A. around the same time. Um, and we both did that play together. And from there, I saw his work and our castmates, and they were so amazing. And I thought to myself, I want to go and study. So I went to New York. Mm -hmm. In New York, um, Rizwan Munji and Poor Bye Baby had started a South Asian American theater company. Okay. And it was called Disha Theater, and this was their first feature that they put together. So it was very much a grassroots effort. Um, Rizwan asked me to play mm -hmm. the part. And that's kind of where I saw that there's this new niche community within the arts mm -hmm. that I related to on multiple levels as well, culturally as well as artistically. And the stories we wanted to tell were unique and um, not identity stories, but very fun, societally relevant stories um, in the backdrop of a comedy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, you took the Mesner <clears throat> technique. Can you explain to our audience what that is and how many techniques are there, first of all? There, there's quite a few techniques, actually. Mm -hmm. About five. Um, yep, mm -hmm. five mm -hmm. techniques, but there's so many tangents, tangents. to each yes. technique yes. based yes. on who you studied with. Yes. So mm -hmm. I did the summer program at the Neighborhood Playhouse, um, which is where Sandy Meisner had originated uh, a school for Meisner Technique. And, um, and from there, I ended up going to William Esper, and um, Bill was, I believe, a disciple of Sandy, and or they were in the same class or something like that. I don't know specifics. Forgive me. That's OK. Um, but I said with Terry Knickerbocker over there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a two year program that just, uh, you know, the biggest part about being an actor is that you have to break down the barriers of um, of just not being able to be yourself yeah. and strip it all off and yeah. then just be authentic yes. and connect with others. <laughs> and that's what Meisner is. Good. Yeah. A lot of people like it. They loved all the styles, and, and, yeah. and they love it. It's yeah. what teach them to be an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, Ted Land is a good friend of mine. He loves that Shakespearean style. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that one, too. As I, I tease him all the time, to be or not to be. Yeah, that, that is a great style, way of yeah. learning. Indeed. I see that. And then in 2010, you did six episodes in the TV series, The Real Girl's Guide to Everything Else. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that was another grassroots effort. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Carmen Elena Mitchell had written the series, and we wanted to create a reaction to sex in the city. Okay. Um, make it a socially relevant political reaction with people of color in Los Angeles. And so it was our take on sex in the city. And um, how did you, what did you find out? Oh, uh, we found out a lot of things. Uh, we kind of based it in um, 
uh, you know, during Afghanistan and everything else. Mm-hmm. And so we had a, a GOP member funding a feminist movement for the underground library in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a very fun series. Yes. It, it was a very fun series to work on. Yes, it did. Yeah. Wow. So now you have, what, 22 TV film acting credits. Hmm. And on all while this is going on, <laughs> you were also working as a producer. Yeah. You had a play, let's see, uh, you were producing, TV, uh, you had 26 producing credits. Not bad. Uh, I see you have a project called Val in Post right now. Yeah, Val is, um, Val is a bit of a sci-fi Buffy-esque pilot that we just shot. It hasn't okay. been released yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is written by Ray Felipe and Brandy Harkonnen. And, um, and it's a very fun world where people are not given a choice on what they do for a living. So we have all these fairy tale characters that are actually in a parallel world and invisible to humans. So they kind of represent the um, complications of humanity. Yes. Yeah. That's what we, we just talked about. That's what we love about this business, telling a story. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all kinds of stories. The, the, the mind has so many things in it. So many things in it and so many things that um, we leave unheard. So I think this form of storytelling is a way that we can get our messages across on a personal level as well as a social level. Um, What we do really does change the fabric of our social culture. Gotcha. So I feel like there is a social responsibility to every story we choose to tell. Gotcha. So you've worked hard. You now have 26 IMDb credits for being a producer. That's exciting. Yes, the more the merrier. Because you know these days people say, well, what's this IMDb? Who are they? It's an organization that they will put your resume together for you. And uh, you you not know it, but I'm just for the benefit of people that don't know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, on this show, for example, I have a habit. Mm -hmm. When someone says, well, I'm going to have you as a guest, first thing I do is I go look up IMDb. Mm -hmm. If I don't see your name on there, I go... Not today. <laughs> well, they have IMDb people here. They've, they've shown that they had that spirit and all the skill and all that good stuff. Um, how about directing? There's something that you might want. Have you, have you, obviously, you've tried. I'm not going to ask you, have you tried it? Yes, you've done it. Yeah, I've done a little bit. I yes. d- I've done a little bit. And um, I am growing that world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so right now I'm working on a play called Defenders. Okay. Yeah, it's a World War II play, and it takes place in Iceland, a small church in Iceland. Uh-huh. And um, we have three American GIs who get stranded. In what does church. GI stand for? Oh, gosh. Would you believe it's a government issue? <laughs> See, you would know more than I would. Yeah, like I was in the military. And I yeah, know. I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, when I went, GI, GI, because people, they meet you. GI. Yeah. So if you knew what it meant, you wouldn't call me GI. Right, government right. Government issue, that's what it means. Which is kind of crazy. And then yeah. you think about the draft and you think about all the implications in terms yes. of, you know, your position in society based on whether or not you wanted to be drafted. Mm-hmm. And um, I think historically speaking, we've seen that from Vietnam onwards, there's a lot of tragedy and a yeah. lot of complications that happen with that choice. Yes, PSD, yeah. continuing on that. Mm-hmm. Idea. Um, when did you first get the idea of directing on your plate? Um, that's an excellent question. Yes. I think it's a natural progression. Right. When, uh, when you produce for people, when I produce, I like to envision or help envision what, what my director wants to see mm-hmm. on film, on the stage, um, on your computer screen. Um, so you start with conversations and you try to figure out what is this person trying to say to the people, to the common people? What, what are the messages? How do they want uh, characters represented? Um, and through time you realize that, for me at least, I realize that my vision is very specific. It's very specific. And, um, and you just kind of need to realize it yourself after a certain point. Mm-hmm. And so uh, for, for me, a lot of it is about um, bringing voice to people who don't have a voice. Right. And so how do, you, how do you incorporate that into the arts and into casting right. and into storytelling? I like it because yeah. being a director is, is what I call a professional profession. Yeah, people know what you do. Yes. That's always important. <laughs> <laughs> the, the different, there are a lot of differences as a director between film, TV. Can you tell us a little bit about those differences? Yeah, um, I, I haven't done a ton of film directing yet. I have okay. shadowed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very technical, it seems like. Television directing is very technical. Um, film directing is very artistic. Yes. You have collaborator, collaborators that you get to work with for um, months on end before you go into production. So you really have a vision together, and you can create a, a full world together. 
um, before you shoot it. And a theater is the same way. So I feel like theater and, and film have very similar, um, a very similar process in terms of how you prep for a project yes. and um, including all your designers to create that vision together. Television is very compartmentalized compared to that. Yes. Yeah. But I hear a film is shot out of sequence. Um, often, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So as an actor, it's, you really have to stay on top of uh, where you are in your heart and in your arc and, um, you know, where your character is going. You really mm -hmm. have to stay on top of all of that and know exactly what point in your timeline you're on. Mm. You know, there's something that is very that bothers a lot of people, and that is the fact that there's a <coughs> definite shortage, especially for female directors in this business. What's that all about? <laughs> there's no shortage at all. There's not. There's no shortage at That's all. That's a rumor. <clears throat> oh yeah. How um, do rumors get started? <laughs> oh, they get started because people don't open their eyes ah. and look around them and provide opportunities for for niche markets. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there is no shortage. I. Uh, I laugh hysterically every time somebody says that because we're out there. There are female directors everywhere you turn, mm -hmm. and they're very, very talented. Um, it takes twice as many credits for a female director to get as far as a male director with one credit. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's very um, complicated. Uh, is a shortage, if there is one, due to racism of sorts? Um, I don't think it's racism. I think it's ignorance. Go for it. I yeah, think it's a, yeah, a lot of ignorance. Yeah. There's a lot of ignorance, mm -hmm. and so how do we facilitate as storytellers? How do we facilitate um, cultures, niche markets, genders, um, gender biases? Mm -hmm. How do we normalize all of that? How do we make it part of our everyday lifestyle so that it doesn't become something new and something different? Mm -hmm. So I think that happens in terms of casting predominantly. Okay. Because um, what we see is what we believe. I remember when I was a kid, and um, my parents would take me to the ice rink because I used to ice skate. And I didn't see anybody who looked like me on the rink. Okay. Um, it was in Arizona and Mesa, Arizona. And um, I would turn on the television and watch Surya Bonnelly. Yes. And Surya Bonnelly was this beautiful, magnificent, athletic ice skater mm -hmm. and dark skin. And mm -hmm. she made me feel like I belonged. Yes. And um, and soon there was Christy Yamaguchi and Debbie Thomas. There, there were so many people who came up um, yes. in that world. So what I saw really led me to believe that I can do this. I can yes. be a competitive figure skater. Mm -hmm. um, cut to the media and entertainment. The more we see marginalized communities being cast in stereotypes, the more people in audiences will believe that's true. Yeah. So how do we break the barrier? How do you do it? Um, and I think a lot of a lot of people think behind the scenes, behind the scenes, behind mm -hmm. the scenes. But what you don't see, you don't believe exists. Right. So I think what what ends up in the camera is is for me incredibly important, as important as what happens behind the scenes. Got you. Have you seen Harriet yet? I haven't. No, I have not seen Harriet yet. I'm gonna go next. I haven't seen it. I'm gonna go next weekend and give it a shot. Great. See what it's all about because Excellent. I've heard so much about it. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say one thing. Here's something that people need to understand. When you go to a movie and you buy a ticket, mm -hmm. look at your ticket. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Look, you know what I'm talking about. Box office numbers. Yes. Box office numbers. Make sure the right movie is on that ticket. Right. Yeah. Been doing that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's an interesting thing to think about because, um, you know, there's, there's two sides of it because box office numbers dictate so much about what kinds of movies get okay. made in the future. Um, but in the same breath, uh, we're not looking at the profit margins, what kind of money was put into the into the movie to begin with. Gotcha. And then um, how do ticket sales compare in terms of P&L's profit and losses on that? And, um, and I think we're slowly realizing that all the movies we weren't funding previously, which are vastly under budgeted, mm -hmm. are making incredible profits yes. despite. Yes. So uh, that says a lot about how our how our film industry is changing. Never a dull moment. In this never business. a dull moment. <laughs> never, 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 never. <laughs> yeah. You're here today for several reasons. One of them is you you mentioned it, the play, The Defenders. Please mm -hmm. tell our audience, what is The Defenders about? You mentioned yeah. it. Um, about G.I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Defenders, Defenders. It's about so many things. Yeah. Kaylin Harrison wrote this beautiful, beautiful play. And, um, and it's... It could be defined uh, as a war play, but um, I think it's a human experience play. It's just set on the backdrop of war. Okay. Um, we have three GIs who get stranded in a small church off the coast of Iceland, mm -hmm. 
and the there are two Icelandic people. There's a reverend and his daughter who live on the same island and a population of about 200 people. So um, his daughter is exposed to Annie Oakley and um, Andrew's sisters, all the all the good old 1940s pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, and the GIs are here thinking they're saving them from the Nazis. And so um, it becomes a struggle between trusting these American GIs who've never been on their land before and they've right. never met anyone like this before. So we're talking about the other and these are the American GIs. Mm. Um, and culture stripping. And so their fear is that these American GIs are going to come in and change their world. So we see this in war all the time. Yes. Right? Yes, we do. Um, in our story, when we have a community of people who don't feel like they can fight back or protect themselves, um, in our story, the environment takes over and protects them for, for them. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So it's a bit of mystique and a mm. bit of history and a bit of war all put into one play. All right. Yeah. We got to cut. Uh, can you run that for me, Tony? Here we go. We have no foreign soldiers in Iceland till now. It's about three GIs in Iceland during the Second World War who are overwhelmed by the environment there and are fairly, they're dependent on the locals. It's really about nature versus politics. This play is insanely unique. It marries societal issues, class separation, the multiple cultures across America with a foreign world. Um, but with that, it talks about human experience, um, emotional separation from each other. And then in this world, the environment comes to save us all. So the one true holy thing in this world, which to me is the earth. Um, just as a human, so when I read the play, I was very much like, oh, I really wow. relate to this. Looks like a very interesting play. Yeah. <laughs> now tell us about the theater, how to get tickets, etc., etc. Absolutely. Um, Defenders is going to be playing November 9th through December 8th, okay. and we play on Saturdays and Mondays at 8 p.m., Sundays at 3. Uh, you can get tickets, I have to read it off this card, um, at www.onstage411.com slash defenders. Okay. Um, tickets are on sale there, and on uh, on Sundays after our matinee, we are having three panel discussions um, for the audience uh -huh. for subject matter pertaining to the play. Okay. Yep. Uh, we have a picture of the theater itself, so people can see what the picture looks like. Oh, yeah. great. There it is. There it is. There yes. we are. Very interesting pl platform there. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Our set build happened this week, and it's going to be a whole different space. I like that because you can just reach out and touch. Uh-huh, yeah. And it's right in a confined area, but you can see it all the time. The, the intimacy. Players. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Now, you said you're going to do some sort of a panel on um, uh, people in the military? Yeah, yeah. So this Sunday, um, Veterans Weekend, uh -huh. uh, we're having a panel discussion about um, war representations in the media and entertainment. I see. And so we just want to talk to vets and see their perception on um, on how, you know, all the life that they've been through, yes. how entertainment uh, depicts it. Okay, I, I don't yeah. surprise you, but your publicist invited me to this. I know. And I told her, I said, I, I'll be there. That's I, I wonderful. Will be there. <laughs> I will be there for sure. <laughs> for sure. That's great. Um, also, speaking about websites, mm -hmm. you've got a marvelous website, www. Well, you, please. <laughs> www.rena.com. Uh -huh. um, so I, I am a director, actor, and producer, and so I've tried to consolidate all my work uh -huh. in one space. In one space? Yes. You're going to get a lot of, of uh, experience out of this one, yeah. more and more. The yeah. more you do, the better it has. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. So. I know your parents are very happy of you. I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. They, they are. are. Yeah. Final question, how do you want to be remembered? Mm. Um, that's a great question. I, I, I want to be remembered... I want to be rem remembered as somebody who tried to give voice to things that weren't heard nearly enough. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's a good way to go. I'm, I'm, thank you for coming today. Uh, we wish we had more time. Mm, thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. We, 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 anytime we deal with a lot of the publicists in this town, they really, there's some good publicists in this town. Yeah, there are. Yeah, that's all I can say about that. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Oh, Thank oh, you. How can I forget something? Excuse me. I forgot something. Uh -oh. Your right hand, please. Uh, right hand? Yes. There's a silver dollar for the lady. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, I'll give this back to you now. Thank <laughs> Oops, you. Thank you, you so much. My pleasure. Thank My you. Ple the red beautiful. goes with the red that you're wearing right there. Yeah, it does. I did that on purpose. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Special thanks to our sponsors, Harvey Brandman, Photography is an Art, Ron Irwin's Haiku, Style, Passion, Heart, Larry Buford's Book to the Future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule, State Farm Agent, Carla Green, and our new sponsor, Rob Brownstein and his training school and active space. And thanks to our guest today, Actress, director, Rena Dute, uh, and director, producer, writer, Patrick Jerome. And, of course, special thanks to our ever-growing audience. We say be well, and we'll see you the next time.